Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm, my name is Dr. Vishwanath Is. I'm a medical oncologist with Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. And on behalf of uh, CPOEM, which stands for Creative Portal for Oncology Education and More, uh, which is an education-driven company and which uh, drives to promote medical education in the field of oncology, especially doing webinars in the current era of COVID pandemic and going forward also doing workshops and also help practicing clinicians to make better decision making. So uh, we all know that a plethora of new drugs have entered the scene of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer as well as locally advanced breast cancer. And uh, we thought it would be a great idea to put together a webinar on this topic and uh, with internationally uh, renowned speakers. And uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Prasad Narayan from uh, Sitecare Hospitals in Bangalore. And we have Dr. Margaret Gatti Mays from the uh, Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. And we also have Dr. Mani Singhal, who is a senior consultant medical oncologist from Indra Prastha Apollo Hospitals. So uh, to start with, uh, I would like to, so this is the agenda. So we have uh, Dr. Prasad, it's a few short, it's going to be all short talks, 15, 15 minutes of uh, talks. We'll start with Dr. Prasad Narayan, who'll be talking about triple positive metastatic breast cancer. And then we have the international speaker, uh, Dr. Gathi Mays, who will be talking about uh, the management of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, especially in the post pertuzumab and the DDM1 failure setting. And then we will have uh, Dr. Manish Singhal, who will again be talking about uh, the outcomes of HER2 positive locally advanced breast cancer. And then we will have uh, again the international speaker talking about uh, the uh, management of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer with brain metastasis. And then uh, we will have a moderation by Dr. Santosh Kumar Devdas. Um, on uh, basically, uh, he will be uh, asking questions to our, uh, uh, our renowned panelists and uh, generating a discussion out of that. Uh, so this is the agenda for the meeting. And uh, the first speaker for today, and this is the, here is the educational grant from uh, Mylan and uh, Zydus Pharmaceuticals for today. And uh, a few housekeeping instructions before we begin. So please ensure that the internet connectivity is good to have a seamless experience. And by default, all the attendees will be in mute and listen only mode. We request you to do that. And the attendees can also choose to ask questions by typing in the Q&A section. And this session will be recorded. So uh, to start off with the first speaker, uh, here we have a very uh, dynamic uh, uh, personality, Dr. Prasad Narayan, who is the Senior Consultant and Director of Medical Oncology for the Solid Tumor Division at Sidecare Hospitals in Bangalore, India. And he's got a, a great profile. He trained at the Government Medical College Tirvanantapuram for his medical school training. Went on to do his MD internal medicine at Jabalpur and then uh, DM in medical oncology at the prestigious Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And he's got also accreditations from the ESMO certification in medical oncology. oncology. And uh, he's also done a diploma in clinical research. And uh, he's got immense experience a total of 15 years, and he's worked at Dubai. He's worked at the Narayana Hudayalia, the Kiran Mazumdar Shah Cancer Center, and uh, he's got wide experience. And uh, now he's working as uh, a senior consultant medical oncology oncologist at Site Care Hospitals in Bangalore. Uh, without any, without further ado, uh, I request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Prasad Narayan to deliver his first talk, and uh, that will be on metastatic triple positive breast cancer in the HER2 positive setting. So uh, please uh, go ahead, Dr. Prasad Narayan. Thanks, Dr. Vishwanath. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, when we are talking about HER2 positive breast cancer, mostly what uh, we discuss is the anti-HER2 management. And I have been given the task of uh, speaking about a unique group of uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, and that is the triple positive breast cancers. It was interesting to prepare for this uh, presentation. And uh, as we all know, uh, when we take the subtypes of breast cancer, we usually focus them into two groups. One is the HER2 positive group and the HER2 negative group, which is hormone positive. Among the HER2 positive group, are we going to treat the hormone negative and hormone positive group separately? That is the main thing. And that is where uh, I am going to speak for the next 10-15 minutes. 
So the luminal uh, A, we know that uh, they are different and there is a plethora of treatment which is there. The HER2 positive hormone negative group, we know that uh, there are so many treatment options available and the triple negative is a different subset. So we will be focusing on the triple positive group that is the hormone positive and the HER2 positive group. So the, we all know that HER2 positive breast cancer has got a lot of heterogeneity. Whenever we see uh, there is a uh, spectrum where we are trying to uh, treat some group of patients with a limited uh, anti-HER2 therapy in combination with maybe chemotherapy. There is a, uh, the other end of the spectrum is when we give more than one anti-HER2 therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, then maintenance with uh, anti-HER2 therapy, uh, either in the form of a TKI or continuing the uh, anti-HER2 therapies in different forms. So although the differences in clinical behavior, treatment sensitivity and intrinsic biology between the hormone positive and negative subtypes in HER2 positive disease is known, are we treating all of them uh, in the same form, all the HER2 positive patients or are we, are we differentiating the hormone receptor positive patients? So here we have two targets. One is the endocrine and the HER2 targets. And let us see uh, what the data says. So from the basics, when we go, there is a crosstalk between the ER and HER2 family of receptors. So exposure to anti-HER2 therapy actually may reactivate the estrogen receptor signaling as a mechanism of resistance. The co-expression, that is the hormone receptor expression plus HER2 co-expression is seen to be associated with high proliferation index in this group of patients. So there is an opportunity here for the treatment personalization. We all talk about personalization in the present era in the advanced disease setting where we have either manipulating the hormone uh, receptors or manipulating the anti-HER2 therapy when we treat metastatic triple positive breast cancer patients. But unfortunately, that is uh, when we come to the trials, only a limit number of trials have actually focused on this specific point. And I would say that uh, we will discuss it in a sequence. I will first say about the initial era when we had single anti-HER2 uh, blockage opportunities that was with the trastuzumab and then lapatinib. There were some studies which looked at the hormonal therapy and then dual anti-HER2 therapy opportunities and some ongoing studies where the, we are trying dual anti-hormonal therapy with anti-HER2 therapies. So the interest in this group is there since a long time. And this uh, data is very interesting. I found it very interesting that when we look at the expression of ER, that is more than 30% of, ER, uh, of the tumor cells expressing ER, when we define that as high expression, there is a reduced probability of the treatment response to trastuzumab and chemotherapy, which is very interesting. Meanwhile, when you take the patients who are having even one, more than 1% 1 of the tumor cell expressing hormone receptor positive tumors, maintenance endocrine therapy, added to trastuzumab, which is very important. I mean, when today also I attended a talk where the speaker was saying that when they give it combination of trastuzumab and pertuzumab in metastatic breast cancer with chemotherapy, during the maintenance phase in hormone positive patients, they may not add an anti-endocrine anti therapy, which was very interesting to listen to, but giving a maintenance endocrine therapy upon completion of chemotherapy is associated with a significant progression-free survival improvement which we can see in the next slide. So if you take the ER positive more than 30% group, there is an improvement in PFS from 16 to 16 from 11 months. And if you take both ER and PR positivity, again, there is an improvement which stays. So definitely when you are considering the ER expression, patients who have ER expression and HER2 expression, giving them hormone therapy along with any kind of anti-HER2 therapy improves the outcome in metastatic breast cancer. And this is the same, uh, the same data being presented in a different form so that we have a perspective on that. So patients who have high expression of ER or PR and who are not given maintenance versus those who were given maintenance, there is a difference in the outcome. 
Now we will look at some of the trials which have looked at this uh, this question. So we all have this. Uh, uh, I mean, we were all we are all looking for giving patients uh, less intense therapies in metastatic breast cancer with similar outcomes. So this is a randomized phase three trial which looked at the aromatase inhibitor anastasol in combination with trastuzumab versus anastasol alone. So the question asked is whether anti HER2 therapy added to the hormone anti-hormonal therapy improves outcome. And there was an improvement in outcome. The PFS was 4.8 versus 2.4. So statistically significant and overall survival was also better when we add trastuzumab to this group of patients. Similar study with the other aromatase inhibitor with letrozole. This was a small study. In this, the majority of the patients had received tamoxifen and 82% of them had new fish plus or ISC3 plus. And the, this is an initial study which proved that combined trastuzumab and letrozole for patients with both positivity produced durable responses. So that led to the phase three trial, which established this combination as similar to the, the anastasol study, where there was an improvement uh, of time to progression uh, from 3.3 uh, months was in the letrozole alone arm versus 14.1 months in the combined arm. So definitely adding trastuzumab to letrozole became a standard of care if you are treating a patient of triple positive breast cancer. Now, then came the other uh, anti-HER2 option which we had, and that was lepatinib. So another, this was an exciting study. When the study came, we were all very happy because we have two oral drugs which we can use in metastatic uh, triple positive breast cancer. And a very well tolerated treatment and was used quite frequently in our practice before. And lepatinib letrozole combination uh, versus letrozole or placebo, there was an 8.2 months PFS versus three months and median overall survival was 33.3 months. Maybe that is because of the crossover to the other arm. So definitely letrozole and lepatinib significantly enhances the PFS and the clinical benefit rate was the outcome of this study. Now, then came the era of double HER2 blockage. So actually in this era, what, was, what happened was that the hormone therapy of, uh, manipulations were very minimally done in most of the clinical trials. It was always about how can we improve the outcomes in HER2 positive breast cancer and then looking at the subgroup of hormone positive patients and see whether they improved. So this was the study which looked at the patient's first line trastuzumab plus an aromatase inhibitor with or without pertuzumab. And uh, this is the phase two study. Patients with HER2 positive and hormone receptor positive, either metastatic or LABC, they were not pre prior treated with any systemic non-hormonal anti-cancer therapy. The choice of chemotherapy must be specified before the randomization. So the patients were given either pertuzumab, trastuzumab plus either an aromatase inhibitor or the patients were given chemotherapy followed by aromatase inhibitor. The control arm had only trastuzumab. So basically the question was whether adding the pertuzumab to the trastuzumab improved outcomes here. And the subgroup analysis was whether the, a hormone only option was okay in this group of patients. So this trial answered one question. That was whether adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab definitely improves outcome. That was a taken. And now we know that that is the standard of care. But when we compare the arm which received only an aromatase inhibitor. Also, when you combine a dual anti-HER2 therapy, there is an improvement in outcome. So if you have a dual anti-HER2 therapy option, can be safely given with better outcomes than giving a single agent anti-HER2 therapy in combination with an aromatase inhibitor. So this gives us that, uh, that option where we have an oral uh, aromatase inhibitor plus a combination of uh, the standard combination of two anti-HER2 therapies with good outcome. The safety profile was consistent with the previous trial of trials of pertuzumab and trastuzumab. Now, similar study which looked at lepatinib plus trastuzumab. So, uh, postmenopausal patients cytologically or histologically confirmed triple positive breast, metastatic breast cancer were uh, randomized to either two anti-HER2 therapies which was trastuzumab, lepatinib, or trastuzumab plus aromatase inhibitor or lepatinib plus aromatase. So this is asking a different question of whether combination is better against single agent. And 
whether we can give two, uh, the, as I told you before, the or, two oral options of aromatase inhibitors plus lepatinib versus adding trastuzumab. It was a very clear cut uh, outcome that dual blockage is better, better progression free survival in this group. So, if you have an option of a dual blockage in anti HER2, then that is definitely the standard of care when we are combining them with the aromatase inhibitor. Now, coming to the present era, that is when we have a major interest in the hormone positive metastatic breast cancer with CDK4. Six inhibitors. If you ask me whether we have any strong data to say that uh, this can be a first line therapy, I will say no. But there is definitely some data which we are going to see in, in the coming time, and there is some data which we already know. So, this was the much anticipated Monarch Health study result, the randomized phase two study of Abima cyclic plus trastuzumab with or without full western. So, it is only a single agent anti her 2 therapy with dual anti-hormonal therapy. A very important question to ask. Plus standard of care chemotherapy in women with her 2 positive or triple positive breast cancer. So mind you, these patients has, have already received taxane, TDM1, and at least two anti her 2 agents for advanced disease. So this is the group of patients where definitely we would also like to do some different kind of an approach of manipulating the anti-hormonal therapy option because these patients have failed most of the other options we have in anti her 2 therapy. So this study, uh, which according to me, is a, has significantly uh, gave us an option of manipulating the hormonal uh, anti-hormonal therapies in metastatic breast cancer patients who have received at least two anti her 2 therapies. The efficacy analysis showed a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival, 8.3 months versus 5.7 months with the Abima cyclic plus trastuzumab fulvestrin arm when compared with the trastuzumab chemotherapy arm. So that is what uh, we would have otherwise given. The patient who has failed uh, to anti her 2 therapy, we would have changed the chemotherapy backbone and continued the trastuzumab. So and, uh, instead of that, if you give Abima cyclic plus western along with trastuzumab, there is an improvement in progression-free survival. So this pivotal study suggested that a chemotherapy-free regime can be uh, considered in these heavily pre-treated metastatic breast cancer patients by combining a CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy. It may be an alternative, active and effective treatment in this group of patients. Now, uh, this is an abstract. Uh, this is uh, not, uh, this is with palbocyclib, the other CD446 inhibitor that we have, which has, a, this is a uh, group of patients in stage one and stage two. They are trying, the, 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 the attempt is to see different combinations actually. Either giving palbocyclib 200 milligram instead of the usual dose that we give, plus trastuzumab three weekly. And in the uh, in this, the second phase, it is adding letrozole to the palbocyclib, which makes more sense actually. So, or at this point, we can only say that palbocyclib at this dose is safe and if and active in this group of patients. And identification of the non-luminal subtypes by PAM50 might help to identify patients who might not derive a large benefit from this treatment strategy, regardless of the hormone receptor status. So. If I can summarize what I uh, discussed so far, what we have or what we know is that giving an anti HER2 therapy plus an aromatase inhibitor definitely is an option and it is better than giving aromatase inhibitors alone. This is what we know from our first generation trials, if I can call them that. And in the second generation, the question was whether dual anti HER2 therapy with aromatase inhibitor is an option. That is also established now that we can safely give and effectively give a dual anti her therapy. The third question will be whether a dual anti-hormonal therapy can be combined actually. And that I think we will have to wait for the results of the other trials which are ongoing. But the monarch has given us this window of opportunity. And I'm sure that most of us in our practice in that group of patients definitely try this option. So there is substantial lack until recently of clinical trials specifically designed for these group of patients. And as HER2 positive tumors have usually been excluded from the endocrine trial, the studies of 
uh, we don't have that much data in them. So now there is increasing evidence confirming the intrinsic differences cannot be ignored anymore. And there needs to be dedicated trials for triple positive breast cancer, which we will we are definitely having now and we'll wait for the results of them. And the adoption of the molecular stratification, the study which uh, we just showed, seems promising if not necessary to further help us in patient selection in the frame of treatment personalization. So these are the ongoing studies. And I think that we will be getting some of this data very soon. There, is, there are ongoing studies with uh, all the possible combinations which we can have with all the different uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors in combination with fulvestrant or in combination with AIs. There are combinations which is happening with uh, the other anti her therapies that we have, that is combination with TDM1. So it's exciting time. There is there are the ongoing studies with naratinib, pyrotinib, because oral uh, uh, anti her therapy is definitely another uh, excitement actually. So definitely we will have more uh, personalized treatment in HER2 positive breast cancer and specifically in the hormone receptor positive group, which is a triple positive breast cancer group. So the, I think uh, that's all I have. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions either now or uh, in the panel discussion. Thanks. Now, thank you, Dr. Prasad Narayan, for a wonderful talk, very inf insightful talk. Actually, treating this triple positive breast cancer is uh, definitely a challenge. And you spoke very nicely about the evolution of therapy, uh, single HER2 blocker with AI, and then dual HER2 blocker with hormonal therapy. And now the, in the era of CDK4-6 inhibitors with the HER2 blockers, it's definitely an evolving uh, paradigm. So let's move on to the, uh, to the next part of our, uh, of our webinar. And uh, uh, so this is the international speaker, Dr. Gatti Mays. Uh, she is from, uh, she's an assistant professor uh, of internal medicine in the division of medical oncology at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, United States. And Dr. Gatti Mays earned a medical degree at the Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. She completed residency and was a chief resident in the Department of Internal Medicine at the same university and then completed a fellowship in the prestigious National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, uh, uh, Maryland, uh, United States. And then her primary focus is in the treatment of breast cancer, immuno-oncology and early phase clinical trials. And uh, she's done a lot of research in this area. And uh, she also focuses on tumor immunology and the development of novel immunotherapeutic approaches for the treatment of breast cancer, including therapeutic cancer vaccines, cytokines, antibodies or immunomodulators. She is also an investigator on in multiple clinical trials involving immunotherapy, and she has co-authored multiple manuscripts in this field. Dr. Gatti Mays is nationally and internationally recognized as an expert in the field of breast cancer and immuno-oncology, and she is also a fellow of the American College of Physicians and is an active member of the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. A great pleasure in welcoming you, Dr. Gatti Mays, and over to you, Dr. Mays. Great. Thank you so much for, um, for inviting me. Um, what I'm trying, uh, let me try to pull up my, my screens here. Um, oh, let's see. Um, here we go. Sorry, it's, I'm using the the browser and it's, uh, hold on. Do you have my, my slides? Oh, there it is. I see it now. Okay. Can you guys see my slides? Is that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me uh, today to talk um, actually at two separate times. The first is going to be the management of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer after pertuzumab and TDM1. So first I'll start that I have no disclosures and no conflicts of interest related to this lecture, to this presentation. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the objectives um, over the next 15 minutes or so um, are first to cover some breast cancer basics. Uh, next is to talk about the general metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer treatment algorithm. Um, and then finally, to review some pertinent clinical trials related to third line and beyond. Next slide. Uh, 2020 um, in India, the estimated uh, lifetime risk of a woman was one in 29. 
interestingly, in the U.S., it's about one in eight women will develop breast cancer over her lifetime. Um, and in India and the U.S., uh, um, in men, it's about one in a thousand men will develop breast cancer in his lifetime. Of all the breast cancers, about 15 to 20 percent are HER2 positive. Most of these cancers are found in the early setting, uh, either local or local regional, but around 5 to 10 percent are found de novo metastatic or metastatic at diagnosis. Now, historically, HER2 positive breast cancer has been considered an aggressive subtype. Um, however, these HER2 targeting antibodies and various um, small molecules have now greatly changed how we treat patients and how well they do. Uh, next slide. So when we look at the metastatic HER2 positive treatment algorithm, so first line generally tends to be Herceptin, Trastuzumab, and Pertuzumab. This is the Cleopatra regimen, um, which has greatly shown to increase survival um, over time. Uh, with the most recent data presented showing a survival advantage of about 56 months um, from the time of diagnosis. And this improves over Herceptin and Trastuzumab by about 16 months in terms of survival. So that was really one of the main studies that has helped advance how well these patients do with HER2 positive disease. Second line currently is TDM1 or Capsila. Um, however, I wouldn't be surprised maybe if in the next um, few years, if this changes a little bit um, with some of the newer agents that have been shown to be quite promising. And then once we get to third line at this point, this is where we really have a plethora of agents. Um, and sometimes it's almost a little overwhelming to try to figure out where to go to next. And so we're going to, I'm going to review some of the data at this time and, and go over some of my thoughts of kind of the sequencing. Um, I would like to make the disclaimer, though, at this point, the optimal sequence of these agents is really unknown. And so in making the decision for third line and beyond, not only do um, characteristics of the tumor need to be considered and the patient and the tumor volume, but specifically also patient uh, driven factors um, need to be considered as well. Next slide. So this is just kind of a very um, a nice slide, I think, that shows kind of the mechanisms or the point of actions of these various agents that target HER2. Um, some of them are uh, antibodies, some are bispecific antibodies, other, there are many antibody drug conjugates, which is a really promising um, field. Um, but there's also several small molecules which have been shown to be effective in HER2 positive breast cancer. Next slide. So when we start to think of our systemic actions for third line and beyond, you know, as I said, we really have kind of a nice um, palette of options at this point. Um, I'm going to go through and talk about um, kind of these various uh, options and the trials that support them. Um, and so as you can see here, the main agents at this time are Deruxacan, Tucatinib, Margituximab, Neratinib, and then kind of our good old faithful Trastuzumab plus various chemotherapy agents. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you choose in patients without brain metastases? So how do we, how do we sequence these? Um, and really what's the data for that? Next slide. So first to talk about trastuzumab deroxacan, also known as her, and HER2. Um, this is an antibody drug conjugate uh, that has uh, basically uh, Herceptin or trastuzumab that with the um, uh, payload is topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. Um, the approved dose at this point is 5.4 milligrams per kilograms every three weeks. Um, just like Herceptin, the cardiac function needs to be monitored about every three to four months with an echo. And the pivotal trial behind this is the DESTINY trial. And so this was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine. This was a phase two study with 184 patients. And uh, there were about 100% of patients that had prior TDM1, about 65 that had prior pertuzumab. And what was really interesting is that the median number of treatments prior before receiving uh, Deroxacan was six prior treatments in this clinical trial. And as you can see here from the waterfall plot, there, there really was an impressive response rate of about 60% in patients despite being heavily treated. The median progression-free survival was 16.4 months, and the median overall survival has not yet been reached. But at the 12-month uh, analysis point, about 86 percent of patients were still alive. Um, and so this, again, is one of those really uh, encouraging and promising molecules. Uh, next slide. And so when we think, though, of the common side effects, so uh, these are, are just selected some of the ones that are probably the most clinically relevant. 
Um, so we do see a decrease in ANC, uh, all grades about 34%, so about a third of patients with grade three, about 20% of patients. We see febrile neutropenia, though, in a very small percentage number of patients, about 1.6%. Generally, the decrease in ANC has been managed by decreasing the dose and or um, holding the medication. Uh, there's not a lot of data with giving growth factor support, so whether Nupagen or Nulasta with trust use, uh, with Deruxican, um, and nothing that was published that I could find. So it seems that just dose modification is, is the preferred approach to this. Patients can also have anemia, um, nausea, fatigue, and then again, decreased white blood cells. Uh, next slide. And what's important to think about with this is, you know, so first, Patients who receive Deruxican, it seems that if they're going to respond, they respond quickly. So the median time to response in the destiny trial was actually 1.6 months, which was just about the time of the first three staging. So patients who respond are going to respond quickly, um, which is always helpful, I think, especially when there's a large volume of disease. Um, but the other thing to consider about this is there is a boxed warning. So currently, interstitial lung disease has been detected in about 13% of patients who have received this on trials. Um, most of these were grade one or two, but there were, were four patients who died um, and their death was attributed to interstitial lung disease. Symptoms of this include fever, cough, and dyspnea, so very nonspecific symptoms. The median time to onset, though, is a little bit more than half a year, about 90, 193 days. These episodes of interstitial lung disease were managed with dose reductions, discontinuations, steroids in many cases, and then hospitalization for oxygen supplementation. Next slide. Tucatinib is the next molecule we're going to talk about. This is a TKI against HER2. Tucatinib is usually dosed as 300 milligrams by mouth twice a day, and it's given along with capecitabine um, and trastuzumab. Uh, next slide. And so the pivotal trial information for this was actually the HER2 CLIMB trial, which was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this was a randomized phase three trial, about 600 patients. 100% of the patients had had prior pertuzumab and or TDM1. Um, and this was, again, another patient population that was heavily pretreated with a median of four prior therapies. And as you can see here from the progression-free survival that we did see a nice separation of the Kaplan-Meier curves, um, progression-free survival was 7.8 um, versus 5.6 months. Um, and then the survival, um, uh, there was no difference uh, when they checked. Um, however, uh, you know, there is expected perhaps over time um, that this may become significant, but currently there is no statistically significant improvement in survival. Next slide. Common side effects with this are diarrhea. So many um, will recommend the prophylactic or empiric use of Imodium. About 80% of patients had diarrhea of about 12% uh, or so were grade three. And foot syndrome, which is not obviously unexpected with the use of capecitabine. This did not seem like it was statistically significant from using capecitabine and trastuzumab alone. So this is about what we expect with about 60% of patients having some degree of hand foot and about 13% um, having grade three. We do see an increase in liver enzymes, so AFT and ALT in about 20% of patients with around 5% being grade three. Along with this, we can see increases in bilirubin as well. Um, fatigue is fairly common with tucatinib, as is um, stomatitis, but generally they tend to be lower grade. Next slide. And so in terms of other considerations, so as I mentioned, in addition to the increase in liver enzymes of AFT and ALT, we also can see an increase in bilirubin in about 19% of patients. However, generally it's low grade, um, and either dose hold uh, or dose modification is sufficient um, uh, in order to address the bilirubin elevation. We can see an increase in creatinine in about 14% of patients. And what's interesting is uh, this is one of those medications that can increase the creatinine without really affecting the GFR. Um, and the few patients that I've had on tucatinib, I've actually seen this in all of them. Um, and so it does occur early, generally it's in the first cycle or two. And generally, the creatinine um, is stable. It, it seems to be clinically non-significant um, and does respond to dose reductions if, if the creatinine is elevated uh, sufficiently. Um, and one of the considerations with this is you do want to avoid um, use of tucatinib with strong CYP3A inducers, moderate CYP2C8 uh, 
inducers are strong CYP2C8 uh, inhibitors. Next slide. All right, margituximab, um, which is one of another really interesting kind of novel uh, antibody. This is a chimeric FC engineered anti ERBB2 antibody. Um, and as you can see here up on the top right, um, that the, the um, FAB site is actually same as it is to Herceptin. However, the FC portion has been engineered um, to have increased binding affinity. Um, now, margituximab, the recommended dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram IV every three weeks, and it's generally given along chemotherapy. The clinical trial, which we'll talk about in a minute, used uh, four different agents, um, and it was kind of Doc's choice as the combination partner for margituximab. Next slide. And so in terms of the pivotal trial, so the SOFIA trial, which was recently published in JAMA Oncology, um, was a trial that looked at margituximab. This was a randomized phase three trial with about 500 patients. Um, about 90% of patients that had prior pertuzumab and or TDM1. And as I mentioned, they, um, in this study, it was margituximab plus doc's choice of one of these four agents, either capecitabine, aribulin, venerelbine, or gemcitabine. Um, what was interesting is that we did see an increase in progression-free survival, and so um, 5.7 versus 4.4 months. There was no difference in overall survival. Um, some of the chemotherapy-based progression-free survival data was just released at um, ASCO, um, uh, and so we can see that capecitabine had the best or had the longest progression-free survival interval, whereas aribulin, venerelbine, and gemcitabine were all about the same. Um, this is approved in the U.S., and there's been a lot of criticism based upon the small um, improvement in PFS, with many stating, is this really clinically significant? Um, and I think, you know, a lot of uh, physicians are assured by the fact that this is potentially another option. Um, and this does seem to work in patients who are resistant to trastuzumab or who have uh, uh, progressed on pertuzumab. Um, next slide. When we think of common side effects with this, so neutropenia um, is common and, again, is likely due to the chemotherapy um, companion. Um, we see grade three in about 20% of patients. We can see some febrile neutropenia, but relatively low grade. Um, we see anemia and fatigue. Um, but one of the things that's interesting with margituximab is we actually do see infusion reactions, and so pre-medications are recommended. Uh, next slide. And so in terms of the other considerations, as again, the pre-meds, we either consider uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen, diphenhydramine, uh, ranetidine, or dexamethasone. And most of these infusion reactions as occurs with Herceptin occur in the first cycle or two. Um, and then after that, potentially pre-medications can be dropped, although the studies that have, are evaluating that are still ongoing at this time. Next slide. So neratinib, um, which is again, one of the other um, agents that there's been a lot of kind of interest in over the years. This is an ir irreversible PANHER2 TKI. Neratinib is generally given as 240 milligrams by mouth daily and is given along with capecitabine. Next slide. The pivotal trial um, with this is the NALA trial, trial, which was recently published in JCO. This was a randomized phase three trial with about 600 patients. About 60% had had prior pertuzumab and or TDM1. And as you can see here that they looked at the mean progression free survival and this was improved of 8.8 .8 versus 6.6 .6 months. And as you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve do separate um, really kind of almost at that six month time period. And then in terms of the overall survival, this was not statistically significant. Um, uh, and again, I think that, uh, you know, some people are somewhat cautious um, about using neratinib just given the small improvement of PFS without the improvement in overall survival. However, it is potentially another agent um, and an oral agent for patients, um, which sometimes is helpful. Next slide. In terms of side effects for this, so diarrhea is really a, a main issue with neratinib, with diarrhea occurring in more, uh, more than 80% of patients and with about a quarter of patients having grade three or greater diarrhea. Hand foot syndrome is relatively common and again, is likely due to the capecitabine. Nausea, vomiting, and fatigue are also uh, relatively common, but most of it is low grade. Next slide. And in terms of other considerations, so this is one of those agents, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see that, you know, the, it's a little bit slower to declare a response. It's not like in HER2 where we see a response about 1.6 months in, that the average time to response is about 24 weeks. 
Um, in these patients, we do need to monitor liver function tests at least monthly for the first three months as we do see elevations in AST, ALT, and bilirubin. One thing that's interesting, obviously, with these oral agents is sometimes we do have to consider some of the antiacids and other medications that we give alongside them. So neratinib, we actually, um, manufacturers uh, recommend avoiding concurrent use with proton pump inhibitors, and if needed, an H2 blocker is actually preferred. So that's always important to keep in mind. Um, and this is a strong CYP3 or 3A4 inhibitor. Um, so again, you know, trying to make sure you're aware of the concatenate medication. Next slide. Now, in terms of chemotherapy, so, you know, many of the older trials looked at chemotherapy plus trastuzumab um, and, you know, had found kind of consistent progression-free survival intervals of three to seven months. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have discussed well, but now that we have pertuzumab, now that we have TDM1, how does that affect some of those older chemotherapy combinations with trastuzumab? And so many of the trials we just talked about actually had a standard chemotherapy arm that involved trastuzumab with various chemotherapy companions. Um, and as you can see here, really the median progression-free survival still remains about the same, about four to six and a half months. Median survival, again, about 20 to 25 months or so. Um, and so, you know, I think despite the addition of pertuzumab and TDM1, that it doesn't really seem that it's uh, dramatically altered kind of the benefit trastuzumab has. It still has a place um, in these patients who have progressed kind of throughout all the, these other uh, regimens as well. Next slide. So to just kind of review some of the information that we talked about, so the systemic options for third line. So we talked about Duroxacan with the DESTINY trial. Anything that's bolded in this slide is something that was statistically significant. So again, we saw an improvement in progression-free survival, overall response rate, as well as the clinical benefit rate, which is the partial response, complete response, as well as accounting for the patients with stable disease, which in metastatic disease, I think is still a win. Um, to catnib, again, looking at the HER2 CLIMB trial, um, these patients, again, it was a significant improvement in progression-free survival, overall survival, and overall response rate. Clinical benefit rate was elevated, but they did not. That was an exploratory outcome. Margituximab um, is the next agent. And again, they used it with various uh, chemotherapy agents. I kind of um, indicated here in with the asterisk in terms of my preferred combinations with margituximab. Um, and this is based upon the data we see in the SOFIA um, by the chemotherapy regimen. And again, progression-free survival and response rate, rate were significant, but not overall survival. Next slide. And then in terms of the neratinib, um, next slide. So neratinib, um, which should be also coming up on the slide from the NALA trial, again, this was PFS was um, significantly improved as well as the clinical benefit rate, um, but not the survival. Um, and the last part of the slide, which should be up there is trastuzumab with chemotherapy. Again, these multiple studies, again, kind of consistently showing uh, progression-free survival and kind of the four to six and a half month range, which um, with the overall survival about 20 to 25 months. Uh, next slide, please. Could you advance the slide, please? Yes, sir. No, thank you. I have advanced it, uh, Dr. Mays. You're not able to see it? No, so it's okay. Are you on the um, systemic I, options? That yes, the, um, okay. So, um, so kind of in, in looking at all of these agents and in terms of my ordering of these agents for patients without TNF, MEF, I generally will start off with Duroxacan as a third line agent. I think, you know, this really, again, we've seen some very robust outcomes with this. And so, um, you know, I think that this is a good agent, especially if patients have high volume of disease. Um, after that, I generally will move to, to catnib um, with the Cape Cytobine and Trastuzumab. Um, you know, I'll talk about in my next uh, session about CNF metastases, and I think definitely tucatinib has a special role in CNF metastases. For the next line, so this would be fifth line, I think, you know, either the margituximab or neratinib um, combinations, I think, are reasonable options. I do think it's important to point out that in both margituximab um, and neratinib, they're combined with capecitabine. Um, and these, uh, there's really no data for capecitabine combinations after the initial capecitabine exposure. 
Um, I think it's reasonable to do given the data, but again, I do wonder about some of the real world data where we'll see this in terms of sequencing and how potentially this maybe prior Cape cytobine exposure may mitigate some of the benefits we've seen. After this would be lapatinib and Cape cytobine. You know, I think while this regimen does not have a ton of um, uh, benefit, it is an oral regimen. And so for many of our patients, it allows from a quality of life perspective um, for them not to have to come in and see us as much. And then finally, trust you the MAP plus chemo. And I think obviously any time during this, it's appropriate for clinical trial involvement. Um, and so it's something important to consider. Next slide. So just to kind of summarize, you know, breast cancer basics. So about 15 to 20% of all breast cancers are HER2. In terms of metastatic HER2, really your first and second line, I think we have some pretty good data at this time, although it'll be interesting to see how some of these newer agents disrupt perhaps this current algorithm. And then in terms of the curtain clinical trials, you know, if no brain mess, as we just talked about, kind of duroxacan and then followed by tucatinib, um, and then either margituximab or neratinib. Next slide. So in summary, there are multiple agents now approved in third line and beyond. The exact order of these, though, is unclear. Um, again, you want to consider patient factors like volume of disease, rate of disease, dosing schedule, dosing route, and adverse events. Um, and I think ultimately the real world data is going to be really important, re the sequencing and the resulting clinical benefits from these now that we have a nice selection to choose from. Next slide. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mays. It was a wonderful talk. You beautifully summarized uh, all the newer drugs with, uh, which block the HER2 and uh, in combination with chemotherapy, in combination with capsitabin. I think it was a wonderful talk. So changing gears, let's move on to the uh, next session. I think we have uh, we have Dr. Manish Singhal, who is a senior consultant medical oncologist from Indraprastha Apollo. I'll just introduce. So Dr. Manish Singhal has uh, done his uh, MD in internal medicine and uh, DM in medical oncology, oncology from the uh, Apex Institute, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And um, he's got several awards uh, to his credit and he's also the DNB uh, teacher and examiner, uh, which leads to the, it's basically a fellowship in India, which leads to becoming a full-fledged uh, medical oncologist in India. And uh, he's currently working as a senior consultant in medical oncology in, uh, at the Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals in New Delhi. Uh, over to you, Dr. Manish. Yeah, hi, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, uh, greetings from New Delhi to everyone. And, uh, uh, so we know that uh, uh, it's, uh, gradually has it has become so very important to uh, consider new adjuvant chemotherapy with ever increasing and evolving success of HER2 targeted therapies in uh, HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, so considering a new adjuvant approach has become so very important because uh, the gains of new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, has resulted into uh, not only getting be better uh, complete pathological responses, but also modulating your uh, post-surgery approach based on the type of response that you get from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. You can move to the... So this is uh, from four major cancer centers in India, which describe that stage three, that is uh, the actually explained as uh, locally advanced uh, breast cancer uh, coming from various parts of the country, uh, sees that around in excess of 40% patients uh, actually have uh, a locally advanced breast cancer and uh, from coming from various parts of the country. So we have a decent burden of locally advanced disease. Next slide. And uh, if you look at uh, from the perspective of uh, the TNM staging, we describe that uh, patients with, who are operable at diagnosis are actually constitutes not only stage 1A and B, but also stage 2A and 2B, where even larger tumors uh, such as more than three centi uh, more than five centimeter and those who have uh, node 1 disease can be actually uh, are, are technically operable. But this, this definition uh, has evolved as far as offering uh, operable uh, breast cancers uh, surgery upfront versus offering them new adjuvant therapy upfront has evolved uh, as our understanding of dealing with uh, HER2 positive breast cancer has evolved. 
and uh, the two locally advanced breast cancers are actually the T3, T4, those who have nodal disease, which are fixed nodes uh, clinically. But uh, now we are offering new adjuvant chemotherapies to many more uh, patients who are not technically locally advanced, but still early because of the evolving paradigm. Next slide. So there are set uh, advantages of uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy, be it be in a locally advanced, actually locally advanced breast cancer, or be it be otherwise not so locally advanced. Uh, one, it avoids mastectomy. It also uh, enables definitive surgery to be performed in a real locally advanced where margins may be a consideration. It also potentially has an advantage over uh, micrometastatic disease and also helps you early assess uh, early assess the treatment treatment and subsequent individualization of the therapy that, has, that I highlighted. Next slide, please. So uh, now we are uh, basically offering any tumor which is more than two centimeter, a new adjuvant approach. So not to actually qualify it as a locally advanced disease, but uh, all patients who are more than two centimeter actually can be offered a new adjuvant approach. Uh, and uh, to assess the type of response that we get uh, through this uh, particular therapy. Next slide, please. So this uh, has led to evolution of our understanding and how do we assess the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapies. And uh, so we are not only looking at uh, the clinical uh, remission rate, but also pathological complete remission rates. And therefore, uh, the definition of pathological complete remission rates has also involved, uh, evolved over a period of time. The newer ways of uh, assessing response are molecular-based uh, responses and also imaging-based responses, but these are mostly experimental and not used in clinical practice on routine basis. And this defines the local control and the BFS as well as overall survival in long term as well. Next slide. Uh, we know that uh, especially in HER2 positive breast cancers and especially the uh, hormone receptor negative and, um, uh, and uh, HER2 positive breast cancers, the pathological CR rate correlates with uh, long-term event-free survival and overall survival. And therefore, achieving a pathological CR rate has become an important endpoint of new adjuvant therapies. Next slide, please. Uh, which type of pathological CR definition actually associates with the long-term outcome was clearly defined as those patients who have no uh, visible disease either in the breast or the axillary nodes uh, or have only DCIS. That was the definition which was allowed because that correlated with the event free survival and overall survival. Next slide. And which was also uh, echoed by the uh, US FDA pathological CR definition that they allowed no uh, visible disease either in the breast or the node, but DCIS was allowed. Next slide. So pathological CR rates are uh, differs based on the molecular subtype and uh, the more the aggressive diseases such as triple negative breast cancers, HR negative, HER2 positive breast cancers and uh, um, are the ones which actually are able to achieve the best pathological complete remission rates. Next slide. And uh, this bar graph depicts the same thing that pathological CR rates may uh, be as high as in excess of 50% in patients who have uh, HER2 positive uh, HR negative disease and hovers around 30 to 40% with HER2 positive HR positive diseases. However, in triple negative breast cancers, uh, this 34% has evolved further and perhaps around 50% patients will be able to achieve a pathological CR, the type of newer therapies that we have, which may uh, involve uh, immunotherapies uh, also. Next slide. Uh, so one very early studies, uh, the NOAA st uh, study, which uh, described uh, the use of trastuzumab in early days uh, for HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, however, this particular study used uh, Herceptin along with Anthras and along with uh, the CMF protocol. Uh, it was a different protocol in those days, but it did, did define that uh, the use of trastuzumab increases pathological CR rates is correlated with survival. Next slide. Which correlated with survival and 
So the event free survival was improved with the addition of chemotherapy, uh, with the addition of trastuzumab to chemotherapy. Uh, next slide. And it also showed that the pathological CR rates were enhanced, uh, were almost doubled uh, with the addition of trastuzumab in the uh, in the HER2 population and the intention to treat population as well. Next slide. And uh, this also correlated with the event-free survival rates based on the event uh, based on the pathological CR, which was 54.8% uh, versus 86.5%. Uh, which was statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.29. Next slide. So pathological CR rate uh, uh, was considered as a possible primary endpoint. And this was one of the uh, very early studies which actually highlighted this importance. After that, there were many other studies and uh, which led to the CT new BC uh, meta-analysis, which decided that yes, pathological CR is an important endpoint to be fetched. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, also, it showed that uh, more patients could receive uh, conservative surgery, 13% uh, versus 23%. So the addition of transosomab did result into um, uh, better surgical or improved surgical outcomes. Next slide. Uh, although uh, transosomab was used with, uh, with anthracyclines, but it did not re really result into any decrease or, or more decrease in the left end or significant decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction. And uh, this was, uh, there was no major safety signals which came out of this particular study. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the cumulative incidence was just 2% in excess of uh, the, the HER2 negative population, uh, which, uh, which cardiac tolerability was good despite the concurrent use of trastuzumab and doxorubicin. Next slide. Then came the time of uh, dual HER2 blockade, which we have already seen in many other settings, such as the metastatic setting and uh, even in the adjuvant setting. In the new adjuvant setting, we had pertuzumab uh, being brought in. Next slide. So we had the new SPHERE trial. Uh, next slide. So this was a trial which combined, which had four arms, but we will just concentrate on the first two arms, that is trastuzumab plus taxane versus pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and taxane. And this was followed by surgery, and then trastuzumab was continued with FEC, and then later on uh, as uh, adjuvant therapy. Next slide. Next slide. So it's so, okay. So the primary endpoint of this study was pathological CR rates. Next slide. And it did show that uh, uh, if you were to consider a total pathological CR rate, it was the highest when a dual HER2 blockade was used in comparison to uh, a single blockade. And uh, it was 29%, uh, it was 21% versus 39%, so almost doubling of the pathological CR rate. And this was even further true uh, for HR negative uh, population as compared to HR positive population. So this major difference was coming from the HR negative population, which uh, did a path which achieved a pathological CR rate of around 63% uh, when pertuzumab was combined with trastuzumab along with docetaxel. So this is an important endpoint which was statistically significant. Although the study did uh, look at the progression free survival, although it was not aimed or designed or was statistically powered to look at that. Next slide, please. But it did show that uh, the progression-free survival in the intention to treat population was uh, the best for uh, the combination or the dual HER2 blockade with taxane. But uh, it was not really designed to look at or statistically uh, designed to look at the progression-free survival. Next slide. And the DFS was also significantly better. Uh, it was non statistically significantly better in the PHT arm as compared to the ST arm. Next slide. And as such, there was no new safety signals or cardiac safety signals which were coming with the addition of uh, pertuzumab to uh, trastuzumab uh, with taxanes. Next slide. It also defined as uh, that pathological CR uh, was an important endpoint and that did result into better overall survival and progression free survival in this particular population. Uh, and uh, so pathological CR again was highlighted as 
an important endpoint. Next slide. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this was more true for HR negative tumors as compared to HR positive tumor. That is achieving a pathological CR has definitely very high meaning for the HR negative uh, population, which are HER2 positive, but HR negative. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the same point, the HR positive population perhaps is not so very important to achieve a pathological CR as compared to HR negative. Next slide. Uh, so this is the, as, as said that this was not the primary endpoint of the study and it was not powered to look at the progression free survival between these two arms in the intention to treat. But this fetched a US FDA approval uh, for the use of pertuzumab, trastuzumab in the new advent setting. And uh, this was also in keeping with the results of the Cleopatra study, which was almost published at the same time. And perhaps uh, although the new ALTO study did not uh, achieve, uh, did not achieve the same statistical significance, but achieved the pathological CR significance. But since the ALTO study was negative and the Cleopatra study in the metastatic setting was positive, the pertuzumab trastuzumab combination actually has the USFD approval in the new adjuvant setting. Next slide. So uh, in summary, the pathological CR rates were improved with the addition of pertuzumab and there was substantial anti-tumor activity which was in favor of pertuzumab trastuzumab combination and there was no new safety signals as far as cardiac events were concerned. Next slide. So uh, the overall uh, patients who achieved a pathological CR had a reduced risk of progression free survival or the disease free survival events. And this gained an FDA approval uh, to the combination. Next slide, please. Coming to the last study, the Trifena study, and uh, that is, uh, next slide. Uh, that is a study which uh, looked at various uh, combinations uh, in uh, form of uh, using uh, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, either along with FEC and then uh, with docetaxel uh, versus uh, leaving uh, the pertuzumab trastuzumab combination with FEC and only using with docetaxel versus the TCHP protocol uh, followed by surgery. The main endpoint of the study was actually tolerance in terms of cardiac safety and all. Next slide. And pathological CR was actually a secondary endpoint. Next slide, please. So uh, these are the inclusion criteria. Next slide. So uh, as far as the primary endpoint is concerned, there was no uh, new safety <coughs> signals. And uh, there was more decline in uh, the anthracycline arm as far as uh, the um, left ventricular ejection fraction is concerned. But as such, the therapy was well tolerated with no new safety signals. Next slide. But the more interesting endpoint was the pathological CR rates, which was uh, higher in the TCHP arm as compared to the FEC followed by PHT arm. The uh, pathological CRs did not really increase significantly by including uh, the HER2 targeted therapy with the FEC arm. And this is one point which has been uh, a point of discussion and debate. And there has been other studies which have been done in this regard, such as the Aman Buzdar study called as the Alliance study though, or the ECHOSOC study which again looked at the same point, whether it is important to add the trastuzumab pertuzumab combination. Although it appears that it is safe to do so, but it has not led to increase in pathological CRs or long-term outcomes. Uh, so nobody does that. So you got to combine the trastuzumab and pertuzumab dual HER2 blockade only with the taxane arm, uh, as there is hardly any gain. And there is some hint uh, from previous studies or older studies that there may be some cardiac issues. Next slide. Uh, more importantly, the HR negative and HER2 positive population registered a pathological CR rate of around 83% in this particular study. And uh, uh, the this CR rate was around 79% uh, with uh, using the pertuzumab trastuzumab combination uh, with the anthracyclines as well, which is not practiced routinely. And the FEC followed by PHT arm had a pathological CR rate of around 65% in the HR negative HER2 positive population. So it's appeared that um, we can use perhaps any type of regime 
uh, as far as the HR positive, HER2 positive population is concerned. But for the HR negative and HER2 positive population, perhaps it is a TCHP regime which outstands uh, every other regime, every other combination with a pathological CR rate of around 83%. Uh, we published our own results in uh, ISMO as, a, as, a, as an abstract and poster presentation where we had consecutive patients who were tested with the TCHP regime or the AC followed by THP regime. And we found that our, in our own institution, uh, the pathological CR rates were around 80% with the TCHP regime. Next slide, please. So uh, the study uh, summarized that the concurrent administration of pertuzumab trastuzumab with epiruzumab resulted in similar cardiac tolerability. However, this, uh, uh, this is not the routine practice and the toxicities were, uh, were quite similar between the groups and there were different toxicities of different regime, but all regimes are improved the pathological CR rates. And regardless of the chemotherapy chosen, the combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab in the new adjuvant setting results in high pathological CR rates in excess of 55%, uh, including all comers, but higher so in the HR negative and uh, HER2 positive population. Next slide. So this is in keeping with uh, the current guidelines and uh, the guidelines uh, do tell us to use pertuzumab wherever cost is not a consideration. There are some other studies such as the Christine study where uh, TDM1 was combined with pertuzumab and compared with the TCHP protocol. And the TCHP protocol remained the gold standard without any increase in pathological CRAs with the use of TDM1 and pertuzumab. This was also uh, similar to the findings that we had in, from the metastatic setting there, such as that the Marion study, which did not really result into improved outcomes with TDM1 and pertuzumab. And, uh, but there were similar outcomes in that particular study uh, with TDM1 alone. So uh, the, 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 the garden variety chemotherapy with trastuzumab and pertuzumab remains uh, the standard of care. And that is how new adjuvant uh, therapy is rendered to a locally advanced uh, HER2 positive breast cancer. With that, thank you for your kind attention and back to the organizers. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh... Dr. Manish for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we go back to Dr. Mays. Uh, we, we have this challenging situation of management of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer with brain metastasis. Definitely a challenging subset of patients to treat. And I would like to request Dr. Mays to uh, give her talk. Great, thank you. And would you mind um, driving Second. the slides again? Okay. Sorry. Thank you for inviting me to give a second talk, um, and this time on metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer with brain mass. Um, this obviously has a lot of overlap with my prior talk, um, and so the format will be similar. Uh, next slide. So I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest related to this lecture. Next slide. So first we're gonna talk about HER2 positive brain metastases and the basics um, regarding this. Um, next, we'll talk about brain metastasis control current with pertuzumab-based therapies as well as TDM1. And then finally, we'll go into some of these pertinent clinical trials uh, that we just discussed related to the second and third line um, uh, treatment of HER2-positive breast cancer. Next slide. So breast cancer brain metastases occur in about 25 to 50% of all patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, I always like to start this type of presentation with that statistic because I feel like it really is an overwhelming number of patients um, who will eventually develop breast cancer. Um, only 9% of these patients will have brain mass at diagnosis which means that over the course of their metastatic disease that they have a, a basically a one in two chance of developing brain metastases. And we know when we look at um, survival studies, so this was a nice study that was done by Sarah Hurwitz um, that showed with patients who have HER2 positive disease without brain mass, which is the blue line, that they do very well. And whereas patients who develop CNS metastases after their metastatic diagnoses, that's the black line on the Kaplan-Meier curve here, that they don't do quite as well, but it's the patients who are found to have metastatic disease in the brain at diagnosis that do the worst. 
And I always think that this is important because I think that, you know, HER2 positive breast cancer is really one of those areas that I think there's a lot of potential for prevention of brain mass because it's such a high percentage of patients who will develop them over time. Um, and I think it really says that we need to do better um, as medical oncologists in terms of including these patients with brain mass in our clinical trials and really trying to aggressively treat them as we can. Next slide. So when we think of metastases of the central nervous system, I generally tend to think of it in kind of two components. We have the intraparenchymal or the um, mess within the um, brain. And then we also have leptomeningeal disease. Um, now, leptomeningeal disease, luckily, is only a small proportion of the central nervous brain mass. It's about 5 to 14% incidence. Um, they say actually about uh, maybe up to 14% of patients who have interparenchymal brain mass actually have leptomeningeal disease at the time, but it's, it's rare, luckily, to have leptomeningeal disease by itself. Usually, it will um, accompany interparenchymal disease. But once patients develop leptomeningeal disease, median survival is just a few months at three and a half to four months. Um, and so again, really another patient population that needs a lot more attention in, in trials and in treatments. Now with breast cancer brain mass, it's interesting with just like other visceral mass that when we've looked at pair sampling studies that we can actually see a discordance in specifically HER2 between the primary tumor and the brain metastasis in up to 20% of patients. And I think that this is important to remember, um, mostly because, you know, if we're seeing a nice response to systemic, um, uh, in the, their systemic um, visceral disease, that, and we're not seeing it in the brain, it may be because the brain metastases have a slightly different receptor status. Um, I think it's also important to note because obviously brain metastases are much more challenging to biopsy and to get tissue. Um, and so, you know, if there is a potential to, to get that, especially in a patient who's not responding in the CNF, that it may be worth repeating the receptors. Now, generally speaking, dual treatment is recommended. So much like other um, uh, ways in breast cancer, we have a local therapy with radiation um, and, or, and that could either be stereotactic radio surgery, also known as SRF, um, or whole brain radiation, which is not as preferred, but maybe more um, beneficial in patients who have miliary or diffuse metastatic disease in the CNS. And then also potentially surgery as well for these larger brain metastases with mass effects. Now, in addition to local therapy, we also need systemic therapy. And this historically has had limited effect. Now, most clinical trials, though, have excluded these patients with either brain metastases or leptomeningeal disease. Um, but it's, again, important that we need to do better in terms of including them in trials moving forward. Next slide. So when we start to think about the fact that, you know, up to 50% of patients will develop brain metastases um, who have heard two positive disease, I think, you know, as we start to have treatments like the Cleopatra regimen um, with docetaxel, pertuzumab, and trastuzumab, that really were a game changer in the sense that we allowed patients to now survive longer, to do better longer. We had better systemic control. Um, that you know, obviously, the longer the patients are alive, the more potential they have to develop brain metastases. Next slide. And I think one thing that the Cleopatra study really showed us is that you know, if we have patients who have good systemic control of their disease, we generally tend to have better CNS control. So the Cleopatra study, while they excluded patients with brain metastases, they did obviously have some patients who developed brain metastases over the course of the trial. Um, and this is the data that's presented here um, by uh, Dr. Swain back in 2014. And what you can see here with the Kaplan-Meier curves is that the addition of pertuzumab, um, is that those patients had a longer progression-free survival and a longer overall survival than those patients who did not receive pertuzumab. Um, again, I think with better systemic control, we lead to better CNS control, not only perhaps in the delaying of CNS mess from developing, but also in controlling them once they're present. Next slide. And this is also seen when we look at TDM1 um, and some of the more recent data. So the initial studies with TDM1, like Teresa um, and Amelia, they actually excluded patients who had active brain metastases or brain mess. However, this more recent study, the Camilla study, um, which is more kind of a real-world study, uh, allows the inclusion of patients with brain mass. 
and they allow patients who have both active and treated brain mass. And if you look here um, in terms of the um, spider plot, the top plot is for patients who have received TDM1, who've received radio, um, uh, radio, uh, radiotherapy, and this is either in patients who had recently got it, so within 30 days, or those beyond 30 days. And you can see again, in, in looking at the spider plot, that in patients who've received radiation with TDM1, that they've, they, some patients do have good disease, good control of their CNS disease with TDM1. Um, and again, in this study, they also included patients who had small brain mass that were asymptomatic and did not require radiotherapy. Um, and again, with this, looking at the spider plot, that we do see some good control. So again, I think that these show that if we have good systemic control of the disease, we're likely to have better CNS control as well. Next slide. So now let's kind of switch gears back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago with looking at these novel agents that have just kind of come through for third line and beyond. Um, and again, we're going to kind of go through each of these trials in terms of some of the um, uh, brain uh, disease uh, that they've presented some of this data. Next slide. And so really the question becomes is, now looking at these agents, how do you choose in patients with central nervous system metastases? Next slide. So when we look again back to the Jeroxacan or NHER2, um, the DESTINY trial did include patients with treated stable or asymptomatic brain metastases. And they actually looked specifically at the CNS subgroup. This was a small population though of their total group, about 24 patients and 17 patients had measurable brain metastases at baseline. They found is a median progression-free survival of about 18 months and an overall response rate of about 60%, which is very similar to what they saw in the visceral disease. Now, when they look specifically at these measurable brain mass, so the assessment of the CNS lesions, they actually found that 40% of patients had a partial response when they received Deruxacan, and about 24% had stable disease. And so again, looking at the spider plot here, which was just recently presented at ESMO Brass and at ASCO, um, you know, you can see that some patients do have control of their CNS disease with Deruxacan. Now, this is a small sample, but I do think that it's promising that, again, in, in endorsing the fact that if we have good systemic control, perhaps we have better control of CNS lesions. Next slide. Now, uh, to catnib, and so this is one of the agents I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the HER2 climb trial, aside from what we've talked about today. Um, because this really was, again, one of those game changers, especially for patients with uh, brain metastases. Now, the HER2 CLIMB trial included patients with brain mass, not only treated and asymptomatic brain mass, but patients who had active brain mass. Patients were able to get, rate if they had a baseline imaging and it showed uh, brain mass, they were able to get um, uh, radiation therapy immediately prior to going on trial. Um, and then they were able to receive the, the agents, uh, to catnib, capecitabine, and trastuzumab. And one of the things I find very striking about their brain met analyses, which was just published by um, Dr. Lin and JCO uh, in 2020, is that when we look at the one-year CNS-specific progression-free survival, that in those patients who had two catnib, it was 40%, whereas those who had placebo, which was they just received the uh, trastuzumab and capecitabine, it was 0%. And I feel like that that's one of those numbers that's really striking to show really what an impact to catnib has in the CNS um, disease. And we see that this translates to a better one-year um, CNS-specific overall survival, again, with two catnib having about 70% and placebo uh, down at 46%. Next slide. And what was even more remarkable in this HER2 climb trial is that they look specifically then at patients with active brain mass, and they define this as patients who were untreated or who were treated with radiation and now progressing. And again, these patients, the one-year CNS progression-free survival with two catnib was 35%, whereas with placebo, it was 0%. So again, showing what a difference just one agent can make. Um, and again, this translates to the one-year CNS survival um, with tucatinib at about 71.7%. And I think what's interesting is when you look at the OS um, for CNS, whether it was in all brain mass or in the active brain mass, is we really do see a leveling off of the tucatinib curve kind of once we get to about the two-year mark. Um, and so again, I think really exciting for patients who had very limited treatment. Um, next slide. Now, the HER2 climb study actually excluded patients with uh, leptomeningeal disease. 
And given how positive the results were with HER2 climb, uh, there's currently an ongoing investigator-initiated trial that's evaluating this HER2 regimen in patients with treatment-naive leptomeningeal disease. And they just presented their data at ASCO. This was a poster. And I found that this was really interesting because this showed mm -hmm. definitively that we have good to catnib levels in the CSF, as we can see here in figure A. Um, and as you can see that really two hours after the initial dose, I mean, we have a pretty good concentration of tucatinib in the CSF and it remains relatively stable over time. Again, tucatinib is given twice a day, so it's good to show that it's, it's in the CSF pretty quickly. And that when we compared it to the plasma levels, you know, it almost seemed that the plasma levels, when we looked at the ratio between CSF and plasma, that the plasma levels were a little bit more variable and a little bit slower to get to the optimal range. Now, this study was the first one to document evidence of tucatinib found in the CSF, and currently the efficacy analysis is ongoing, and so definitely looking forward to the results of this trial over time. Next slide. Now, margituximab, this was the SOFIA trial, which did include patients with treated and stable brain metastases. However, no specific brain met endpoints have been reported to date. Um, next slide. Now, neratinib, so the NALA trial included patients with treated, stable, or asymptomatic brain metastases. One of their secondary endpoints of the trial was time to intervention for CNS metastasis, which included radiotherapy, surgery, or CNS-directed um, concatenate medications. And so, uh, you know, this was a slightly different outcome than some of the prior trials have looked at. But when they looked at the incidence of CNS intervention, they did see that neratinib was maybe a little bit better than lapatinib. Um, you know, with the CNS intervention only about 23% versus almost 30% in the lapatinib arm. Next slide. So just to kind of review some of the data um, that we just presented. So again, you know, we have our main agents along here. I think, you know, deroxican, again, is a small sample, but it's very promising with about a 40% partial response rate in brain metastases. Um, and we see that the brain metastases response rates are similar to the visceral um, disease response rates. To catnib, again, really, I think is one of the game changers for CNS disease, um, where we really see um, tremendous improvements in progression-free survival and overall survival related to brain metastases. Margituximab, the data is not reported yet, but we'll eager, eagerly await that in years to come. In neratinib, um, we did see that this decreased the intervention in CNS disease. Um, but again, it was not necessarily a home run with this. And I think when it comes to trastuzumab plus chemotherapy, you know, obviously there have been multiple studies over the years, and many of them excluded patients with brain mass. But I think one thing is clear when we start to look at this, and, and it is consistent throughout the studies, is that even in these patients, even if trastuzumab is not necessarily a, a super impactful agent, or maybe the chemotherapy companion is not a super active agent in the CNS, the trastuzumab-directed therapy is better than no therapy in these patients with brain metastases. Um, next slide. So in terms of kind of the systemic options for patients with brain metastases, you know, I think generally I start off with tucatinib, capecitabine, and trastuzumab. And honestly, I think that this would potentially be a reasonable second line option if a patient had very active CNS disease after completing induction therapy with THP. Um, you know, I may consider using this in place of TDM1. Again, we do see from the Camilla study that TDM1 has some activity, um, but it doesn't really seem to be have as robust effects in the CSF as this regimen did. Um, after tucatinib, um, you could either go to deroxican or neratinib as the next line, with then the following line being the whichever agent you didn't use. Um, you know, I think I would probably err towards deroxican as the next line after tucatinib. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I do have some questions, and, and I haven't really seen any data that shows that if we have capecitabine with tucatinib, will neratinib and capecitabine still be as effective? Um, you know, I think that that's one of the questions I definitely still have in mind. Um, and then after deroxican or neratinib, you know, then again, there's lapatinib or capecitabine. And again, I think this margituximab, I think, is still an unanswered question in terms of where we would fit this in in brain metastases. Next slide. And I think the other thing to keep in mind with these patients is really, you know, a clinical trial at any point, I think, is appropriate for these patients, especially those with leptomeningeal disease. Again, we have limited therapies that work. Um, and so definitely trying to encourage patients to be involved in that. Next slide. 
And so with that, kind of the objectives of this, so we've reviewed some of the brain metastasis basics with about 50% of patients, up to 50% of patients developing brain metastases over time. Um, we see, you know, in the early trials for pertuzumab and TDM1, that many of them excluded brain metastases, um, but treatment may prolong development of brain metastases as we've seen, and we've seen some real-world data now that supports that there is activity of these agents in the CNS. And then um, kind of the last part is pertinent clinical trials um, uh, that we reviewed already and kind of talked about these agents. So one thing, a couple of the things I've not talked about is some of the other promising agents um, that are going on right now. You know, luckily that this is a space that's very saturated. There's a lot of interest in this, um, not only for HER2, but specifically in brain metastasis treatment and prevention. Um, so there's a whole plethora of trials right now that are going on in this. And so this is definitely an exciting um, area uh, to, to be researching in. Uh, next slide. And so with this, so up to 50% of patients um, with HER2 positive disease will get brain metastases. Generally, we want a dual therapeutic approach when appropriate with both local and systemic therapy. And then finally, systemic control is really important for brain metastasis control. And again, I think we see this in many studies. So um, uh, definitely important to kind of keep in mind. Of course, we've all had those patients who've had great systemic control and now we'll have some brain metastases pop up. Um, obviously, it's not 100%, but often it is a good um, indicator of, of how the CNS uh, disease is, is going. Uh, next slide. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mays, for this wonderful talk. Again, very beautifully summarized the most challenging uh, situation, brain metastasis, and we have some impressive drugs in this, uh, in this setting. Uh, let's move on to the last part of the uh, webinar. Um, I request Dr. Santosh uh, to moderate this session. It's going to be uh, the uh, MCQs uh, discussion and also concluding remarks by him. So just to introduce Dr. Santosh, Dr. Santosh is, uh, is a senior medical oncologist at uh, MS Ramiya Medical College and Hospitals in Bangalore. And uh, he's uh, got several publications to his credit, several awards, and uh, he's, uh, he's also a great researcher. And over to you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, thanks, uh, Vishwanath. Um, without uh, wasting much time, I'll just go into the set of poll questions that we prepare uh, in uh, our webinars just to generate some interest and discussion. Uh, and we have uh, three brilliant uh, speakers and uh, thought leaders in this uh, area of HER2 positive uh, breast cancer with us today. So we have all uh, seen the uh, available set of drugs that we can use, both uh, uh, chemotherapy and a variety of targeted therapy that are uh, available uh, uh, to be used in curative and the palliative settings. So um, this is the uh, first question. Uh, this is a 52-year-old woman uh, who presented with a T2N1 uh, tumor, which was ERPR negative and uh, HER2 positive. Uh, she received new adjuvant uh, treatment with uh, AC chemotherapy followed by docetaxel, prestuzumab, and pertuzumab followed by surgery. At surgery, she was found to have a residual disease in her breast, uh, which was one centimeter in size, and a lymph node involved, uh, and the histopathology was of same phenotype, which was HER2 positive and ERPR negative. How will you go ahead and uh, treat this patient in the adjuvant uh, setting? Uh, uh, for the next 30 seconds, I'll allow the participants to uh, choose uh, between uh, TDM1 for the next one year, trastuzumab for the next one year, trastuzumab plus pertuzumab for the next uh, one year, trastuzumab for the next one year, followed by naratinib for the next one year, and trastuzumab, pertuzumab for a year, followed by naratinib. So uh, uh, necessarily, uh, all the questions, all the all the options may be right, depending on the setting that you are working in, the country that you are working in, and the situation uh, that pa the patient is in. Okay. So um, I give fifteen more seconds to end this poll. 
hope uh, uh, as many as of you uh, can answer uh, your choices. Okay, I'll end the poll. Majority feel that it is TDM1 that has to be used for a period of uh, one year. I'll pose, pose the same question to uh, Dr. Prasad Narayanan. What would you do in this uh, uh, particular setting? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, though there is a temptation now with the TDM1 data to go for TDM1, but uh, Continuing trastuzumab, pertuzumab is also one standard of care in this option because we don't have data to say that TDM1 will improve upon patients who have received pertuzumab in near June setting. So I think both the options are okay. In the present era in India, maybe uh, with the TDM1 biosimilar which we have, we can think about that actually. Thank you. So we have, uh, in this setting, we have the data from the affinity trial which showed a small improvement in the node positive subgroup only. And we have the extended trial in which they did an unplanned subgroup analysis later on, in which there was a benefit in hormone receptor positive subset if the naratinib was started within a year of completion of trastuzumab. The invasive disease-free survival benefit was about 5%. And the Catherine trial showed in a particular subset of patients who did not achieve pathological complete response after new adjuvant uh, chemo and trastuzumab, uh, there was a 10% improvement in a three-year uh, disease-free, invasive disease-free survival. However, the overall survival data of this uh, study is not yet out. And uh, time will tell if uh, this will uh, become the standard of care. In the same setting, uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, how do you choose patients whom uh, to give new adjuvant chemotherapy? Dr. Manish was discussing of uh, all patients more than T2 size tumors would get uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy in the HER2 positive breast cancer. And would you use pertuzumab in majority of uh, your patients, uh, money with notwithstanding? Sure. So uh, the first question, I think uh, we all have cha changed our practice of, new, of neoadjuvant chemo treatment in her positive breast cancer because we are now giving for most of our patients and most of our patients are more than T1, T2. So definitely the majority of our patients get uh, neoadjuvant uh, antihertotherapy and chemotherapy. And whoever there is a finance is not a concern, we are giving pertuzumab because there is definite evidence to support the use of pertuzumab in new adjuvant settings. So if there is no financial constraint, my, my treatment option will be giving chemotherapy with uh, dual anti her therapy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Manish Singhal, uh, it was a very, very elaborate and nice talk about with the new adjuvant uh, treatments in LABC. Uh, what is your practice in your uh, clinic? Whether do you offer uh, based on the Catherine trial do you offer TDM1 to all patients who do not achieve a pathological complete response? Yes, uh, we do offer TDM1 to all patients uh, who do not achieve a pathological CR. Do you have a reservation in the fact that the OS data is not yet out uh, in this trial? I think uh, most of the clinical trials are looking at now in the advent setting, not at the OS, because the OS seems to get diluted with subsequent therapies. But invasive disease-free survival has by far been replaced for the want of OS. I think uh, uh, I would not restrict myself. We have got that FDA approval. We have got the invasive disease-free survival with a delta of around 10%. I'm happy with that. Okay, thank you. Point well taken. Dr. Gatimes, uh, there is more and more talk about uh, avoiding anthracycline uh, in these patients with the availability of... Uh, effective regimens like TCH. Uh, what do you do in your practice? Do you completely avoid anthracyclines or still use anthracyclines uh, in these patients uh, in the new adjuvant or the adjuvant setting? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, generally I try to avoid the anthracyclines in these patients. Um, you know, I know the studies before have kind of been not necessarily shown that there's a, a huge benefit um, uh, specifically in outcomes. And there was a recent study, I think called the TRAIN-2 study that, that recently came out within the last year in JAMA that really showed similar event-free survival and 
similar overall survival at three years, but it did show more evidence of cardiotoxicity and more secondary leukemias in the patients who had anthracyclines. So generally speaking, I try to avoid it in my patients. The one caveat is I've recently had a couple of patients who have had very heterogeneous tumors where we have not only HER2, but also um, triple negative breast cancer. Um, and that, I guess, would be the one exception where I would probably use the anthracycline. But other than that, um, you know, I would try to avoid it with uh, with HER2 therapy. Uh, the heterogeneous tumor in the sense of, uh, do you, do, did you do two biopsies uh, or uh, after uh, the surgery you got different <laughs> anthropathology? Yeah, so we, I, I've had two patients that have had multifocal disease. Um, just within the last year um, where there were, you know, two or three masses and we've biopsied um, the masses just because of slightly different appearances, either on imaging um, and have ended up with a triple negative and a HER2. And uh, we, we've confirmed it um, with a repeat te receptor testing um, before proceeding. But, uh, you know, I've had at least, I've had two patients this year where they've had these multifocal tumors with uh, discordant receptors. That's good to know. Uh, one more question. How do you tailor uh, therapy intensity uh, how to increase or decrease in intensity of treatment in the neoadjuvant or the adjuvant setting in these patients? Sure. Is that still directed at me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, generally, if a, if a patient has a larger tumor, so greater than two centimeters or is node positive, um, I generally will proceed with neoadjuvant TCHP um, or I guess PTCH, depending on um, the, the abbreviation you want to use. But, um, I, you know, generally I, I like to um, use that in the neoadjuvant therapy. If a patient has a smaller tumor, or if nodes seem negative, I'll have patients proceed to adjuvant therapy. Um, and then if they have a larger tumor, so greater than two centimeters or a node positive in the adjuvant setting, I'll use TCH. Um, whereas if it's a smaller tumor, so less than two centimeters, no negative, I'll generally use the TH regimen from the APT trial. So uh, this is a proposed strategy that was recently published in Annals of Oncology, which uh, Dr. Gatti was just alluding to. Uh, again, a question to Dr. Gatti Mays. Uh, do you believe in this data of neratinib one year working in endocrine uh, uh, ER positive tumors along with endocrine therapy? And you use it in yeah, practice? So, yeah, so um, I, I definitely will discuss that as an option for my patients, especially with triple positive breast cancer. Um, in the uh, neratinib trials, I believe many of the patients had not received pertuzumab. So these are primarily the way I've used this is if patients have, you know, gone to surgery, um, we found maybe a larger tumor than we expected or more nodes and they got TCH but did not get pertuzumab, then sometimes I'll use the neratinib. Um, but honestly speaking, I've had difficulty keeping patients on um, it for a full year, <laughs> just given the side effects and the fact that this comes at, you know, basically the end of a year and a half or so of treatment. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I definitely discuss it with patients, but I have yet to have someone actually complete the full year. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, insight. Um, going to the next uh, scenario, uh, and it will be a poll again. Dr. Santosh, you're not audible. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Now, yes. So uh, this is a, a different setting, uh, a palliative setting, a metastatic setting. There is a 45-year-old premenopausal woman who presented to us three years ago with early breast cancer. She had T2N0 disease. Her uh, tumor was ER positive and HER2 positive. She underwent the standard treatment of uh, uh, breast conservative surgery, followed by TCH for six cycles, followed by radiation and a year of trastuzumab along with tamoxifen being continued. About, a, about two years later, she relapsed with ER positive and HER2 positive disease in the bones, lungs, and liver. How do you go about treating this patient? Uh, first option being the Cleopatra regimen of docetaxel, trastuzumab, and uh, pertuzumab. 
the second option is the tdm1 the third option was uh, discussed uh, previously the monarch her uh, regimen of abima cyclib fulvistrant and uh, trastuzumab fourth option was uh, chemotherapy the last would be palbocyclib and letrozol so er positive her to positive metastatic breast cancer who relapsed at uh, two years after completing trastuzumab treatment about uh, 15 seconds uh, for us to complete the poll we are running short of time so i'll have to rush most of us uh, um, are uh, leaning towards tdm1 as their uh, uh, favored option in this patient uh let us uh, let us take a uh, understanding from uh, our expert speakers uh dr gatti may uh, what would you do in this patient sure so um you know i think this is a, a great clinical case because i i think you know there's not necessarily a ton of clear data in terms of a, a definite right or a definite wrong answer. Um, I think with her, because it had been two years since her initial treatment, she did not receive pertuzumab. I would probably go with the docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab um, and at least give it a try. Um, you know, I think the only time that I would probably go initially right to TDM1 is if it was a short interval of relapse, so maybe six months to a year. Um, but but two years out, you know, I, I would definitely consider the the T, um, HP. Um, but I think it would be reasonable to go to TDM1 as well. I think, you know, probably just depend on the patient characteristics. I do think with obviously a younger patient, you probably want to be try to be a little bit more aggressive. And my only concern with TDM1 is that the survival advantage was not quite as great with TCH, with THP, um, which is why I would likely start with that, um, just given the survival information. But your answer is uh, that you use the TSSR regimen more than the TDM1. Yeah. Santosh, you're not audible again. Yeah. So uh, going to the next one, are you are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. So going to the next one, uh, this is an amazing uh, survival curve that was uh, again recently published in Lancet, uh, where they showed the end of study uh, survival analysis. At eight years, and they had one third of the patients still alive, and 16% of the patients still taking uh, maintenance trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Dr. Manish, do you see such uh, fantastic results in your uh, patients who get this regimen? Well, uh, honestly speaking, we don't have a lot of patients uh, who are able to afford pertuzumab. So I would not say that you know everybody is able to achieve this. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, we do see certain patients who do respond so well, and uh, they are able to, uh, you know, uh, get along quite well with therapy. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of patients who are on trastuzumab alone, who right. uh, have been, you know, just great responders without even using pertuzumab. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, for Dr. Prasad. What is your approach in? Uh, you did uh, uh, cover this very well in your talk. Uh, maybe I'll skip uh, this question for want of time. I'll go to the next uh, clinical scenario. Two more to go. Uh, So uh, this is a 48-year-old uh, metastatic breast cancer uh, patient who, who is uh, HER2 positive, ERPR negative with lung and bone metastasis, received uh, docetaxel and Herceptin initially. Uh, though uh, pertuzumab was offered to her, uh, she, would, she could not take it. And uh, she was put on Herceptin maintenance for about nine months. And now uh, she has developed a new bone lesion uh, and uh, definite clinical and radiological progression. 
how will you treat this patient? Uh, will you offer this patient uh, chemotherapy, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, or would you give this patient uh, TDM1, or would you use uh, the novel drug trastuzumab, daruxetan, or would you use tucatinib, trastuzumab, or capacitabin along or uh, chemotherapy alone? Uh, 15 more seconds to complete the uh, poll. This is a patient who is progressing on Herceptin. Uh, the essence of the question is, would you use trust pertuzumab in this patient or would you try and use TDM1? So I'll end the polling. Majority would say that uh, they would use TDM1 in this setting. Uh, I will go to uh, Dr. Manish uh, for his inputs on how he would uh, treat this patient. TDM1 is the drug of choice. Right. So TDM1, TDM1 would okay. be the drug of choice. Right. Most of uh, the participants also feel the same. Uh, so uh, again, uh, going to Dr. Manish, uh, would you uh, ever consider using pertuzumab in the second line or uh, uh, using uh, keeping the uh, TDM1 for third line just for the sake of uh, keeping an extra drug when the uh, disease progresses? So, but I would be definitely tempted to do that. Uh, 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 that, you know, to try, if cost is no barrier at all, I do not mind using pertuzumab uh, plus trastuzumab with uh, a chemo agent, uh, maybe capecitabine. But we do have, uh, you know, a Ferexa study which did not uh, meet its primary endpoint because the primary endpoint of the Ferexa was progression free survival. And the progression-free survival was not met. Although the overall survival delta was around nine months, but there was a hierarchical design in that particular study that only if the PFS is met, then only the OS will be, uh, will be considered. So despite a delta of around 9.1 months or so in the overall survival, the study was negative. But it did show that uh, pertuzumab did work uh, in increasing uh, overall survival in addition with capecitabine and trastuzumab in the second line setting. If cost is no bar, then perhaps, and if I don't have access to trastuzumab duristican, I'll definitely be tempted to use pertuzumab. But that's a very unusual case because cost is always a bar in our country. So I think uh, I'll restrict myself to uh, TDM1 in most cases, but yes, pertuzumab can be considered. And we, we always use trastuzumab beyond progression multiple times in these patients. Do you think it is worth using pertuzumab uh, beyond progression like trastuzumab? Pertuzumab beyond progression, we don't have enough data to suggest right. Right. because we have other, other agents, other effective agents, so not beyond progression. Right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, uh, again, uh, coming back to you regarding the use of combination of uh, anti-hormone drugs with a monoclonal antibody like trastuzumab or pertuzumab with a third drug like lapartinib or tucatinib, uh, do you uh, do this in practice regularly? And what is the what are the outcomes of these patients uh, when you use this uh, these combinations? So uh, I mean, when we discuss uh, the data, it is different, and practice is different. We all use a combination of trastuzumab, lapatinib, and and aromatase inhibitor kind of therapy in a good majority of the patients. When we first give chemotherapy in combination with anti HER2, we get into a sort of uh, stable disease, good response, and on maintenance. When we go, we try to give a combination of uh, continue the trastuzumab. As Manish said, we have patients who have done really well. And lapatinib plus uh, uh, aromatase inhibitor combination is very commonly used, actually. In my practice, I use it. And definitely, till we have so many other molecules which are available, I think it will continue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Getty Mays, uh, what are the factors that determine your uh, uh, second line treatment decisions that you did uh, discuss uh, uh, nicely in your presentation. Uh, the common, the second question I want to ask, though we because especially because we don't have access to this drug in our country, what is your experience with uh, the toxicity uh, with this um, new drug, trastuzumab deruxetan? Sure. So um, I guess to the first question in terms of second line treatment decisions, I mean, I think second line for the most part is TDM1 unless 
they have, you know, maybe very rapidly progressing disease, then that's perhaps when I would consider uh, duroxacan, just given the fact that we see a response within one and a half um, months, um, or the other potential variation or divergence from TDM1 as second line would be as if they have very active brain metastases, that's where I would probably go to, to catnib. Um, but outside of that, it, you know, second line, I think, would be TDM1. Um, in terms of the toxicity when it comes to Druxican, so, um, you know, I, you know, it just was approved here in the U.S. not too long ago. I actually have yet to have a patient that I've put on it, um, mostly because many of my patients have been on Tucatinib now <laughs> for quite some time and have done quite well on it. Um, so I actually haven't not needed to move yet to Duroxican, although I'm sure I will. From some of my colleagues, you know, I've heard that for the most part, it's very well tolerated. Um, I think there is obviously a heightened awareness of the interstitial lung disease. Um, and I think people are almost a little hyperactive to it. So um, th that is the one, I think, concern is that a lot of Patients, if they're having cough and fever, which obviously during our current COVID epidemic is somewhat of a cloudy uh, area um, uh, with that. But, you know, I think that's kind of been the only drawback um, is that, uh, it, you know, people tend to be maybe a little bit more um, active in terms of investigating some of the symptoms. Um, but for the most part, it's been pretty well tolerated. And we've seen some, uh, some pretty remarkable and very rapid responses. Um, among some of the patients seen by my colleagues. Thank you. Um, this, I'll skip uh, this slide for want of time. Uh, I'll go. Uh, we should have. We Yeah, should we? It's. Uh... I think uh, this is the last question. I think we'll for the want of time we'll uh, we'll cut short the uh, presentation. And I uh, thank uh, both the uh, all the three speakers and. Uh, uh, our guests today for their wonderful presentations and uh, participation during this uh, panel discussion. I'll hand it over to Vishwanath uh, for the end of the uh, webinar. Yeah. First of all, uh, I would like to thank our esteemed speakers, Dr. Gatti Mays, who has taken time from a busy schedule. Uh, today she has clinic today, but she has actually been very nice to us. She's made time for this uh, webinar and Dr. Manish Singhal, and of course, Dr. Prasad Narayan uh, for delivering such wonderful talks and also participating actively in the question and answer session. And uh, Dr. Santosh uh, for moderating the question and answer session so well, he has taken a lot of efforts to do this. And uh, congratulations to you, Dr. Santosh. And our sponsors, Zydus. Uh, in fact, I would like to make a mention that we have this uh, biosimilar of uh, TDM1, which has uh, significantly changed practice. Many of our patients are able to tolerate, uh, are able to afford TDM1 since this uh, availability of biosimilar of uh, TDM1. And uh, My uh, Myelin Pharmaceuticals also has this uh, plastizumab and uh, other HER2 blockers. So, um, uh, and of course, the attendees who have logged in from various parts of the country and abroad. And thank you so much for a patient listening, and uh, we are sorry for uh, uh, for uh, making it two hours instead of one and a half hours. And uh, thank you so much for a patient listening. And uh, with this, I think we conclude the webinar.